meeting is being recorded. Being recorded. Hmm. So, um, so welcome everyone. I, I'd like to just start because I'm hearing some various feedback. If everyone could put themselves on mute, um, and we'll we'll have a chance during the course of the meeting for us to stop and allow you to unmute yourself and and ask questions as you go along. Um, and just a reminder that this meeting is being recorded and I'd like to extend a welcome to all of you and a happy new year. Um, this is uh, MassDP's uh, Wayside Cleanup Advisory Committee meeting. And uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you to the Wayside Cleanup Advisory Committee members, many of whom I see on screen number one here. Um, uh, the last time we all got together was in October. It's been a very busy period of time uh, since then, and we have a lot of updates to, to give to you today. So I'll apologize in advance if this seems like just a download of information. I know, I know everyone's preference is uh, to provide opportunity for um, more back and forth, but there are a number of just updates, general and and more significant that I wanted to make sure we got through. So um, we're going to be going through those um, myself. I'm Liz Callahan. I'm the Acting Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Wayside Cleanup. And uh, along with me today is Ken Mara um, and uh, Diane Baxter, uh, Peggy Shaw, and Brian Roden. Uh, uh, between us, we'll be covering a number of different topics. Um, so I think I'll start by just sharing my screen and we can just get started. So Ken, am I in the right place in terms yeah. of, okay. Uh, so today's agenda, uh, this is, all in one place, just all the number of different uh, topics I hope to get through and, and we all um, to bring you up to date on, on different things that are happening within the department and the Bureau. Um, first and foremost, it's, it's been um, obviously a time of transition for the department and uh, with the new administration with um, uh, Governor Healy and uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Driscoll and our new Attorney General, Andrea Campbell, um, coming on board. Uh, we also have a new Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs, Rebecca Tepper. Uh, there is also a new cabinet level um, Secretary for Climate, Melissa Hoffer. Um, and just as uh, this week, um, it was announced that there is a new undersecretary for environmental justice up in EEA, uh, uh, Maria Bellin Power. So a lot, lots of um, lots of new uh, people that we're uh, getting to know in in those positions. Uh, we've been preparing transition information in terms of the priorities for our program. Uh, we've started to brief uh, the new administration on on several different topics. So uh, everything is really just started um, started up right away in terms of um, continuing on with the work we've been doing. Uh, we also within DEP have had um, many significant transitions as you all uh, know, uh, Commissioner Marty Suberg uh, stepped down in December and uh, we now um, have acting Commissioner Gary Moran, uh, and Gary is, uh, it's great to have Gary. Gary knows our program very well. Uh, he certainly knows the department, um, all aspects of the part, department as he, uh, for many years, has been the Deputy Commissioner for Operations. And then more recently, he was the Undersecretary up at EEA, under Secretary, former Secretary Card. Um, so, but we are we are all uh, working hard to um, provide information 
um, to EEA and to the governor's office. And that's that's kept us all very busy. Um, also, um, as you all know, um, in December, um, our longtime assistant commissioner for Wayside Cleanup, Paul Locke, retired. Uh, Paul, which, which um, as we were discussing uh, before everyone entered the meeting room, that um, it's really, it's really a big transition for the department as well as Wayside Cleanup. We Wayside Cleanup had had already kind of uh, uh, started to manage without Paul as he as he had been the deputy commissioner for uh, both policy and operations over the last year. Uh, but it's a big loss for the department. It's a it's a big loss for uh, Wayside Cleanup, and um, uh, we 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 will miss him. Um, and uh, I've seen him lately, I, most recently at uh, Commissioner Suberg's uh, going away party last week. And he uh, seems very, very happy uh, with, his, with his new um, role in retirement. So we all very well. Um, another big transition is that um, as of about a month ago, um, Ken Mara has taken over the position of um, division director for policy and program planning within the Bureau. And that is um, enormously helpful to me in terms of being able to um, shift my focus um, more on the assistant commissioner roles, duties, and have Ken uh, take up some of the oversight of um, issues like the MCP amendments, um, the guidance to support uh, the program, as well as training. So uh, just in this last month, um, it's it's been very noticeable to me um, how 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 well uh, this new realignment of of responsibilities is going to work, and I I really appreciate uh, Ken agreeing to step up in that role. Um, let me see. So I've talked about some of the new roles, and and I'll talk about a few more. Uh, going forward, I'm I'm going to start uh, by going through some of these issues and then turn it over to others, and then I'll come back uh, for an, a, a number of other updates, uh, and then uh, we'll end the meeting uh, with uh, Brian Roden will be updating us on activity active exposure pathway mitigation measures and the certification letters that are going out uh, soon. So I, I covered uh, new roles. Um, also a lot moving on to the status of how we're working and our office moves. Last year, we spent a lot of time uh, updating you on the move from the Boston office. And then we were joined midway through the year with uh, the Northeast office also making a move. Uh, we're happy to report that um, those moves have happened. We're, we're both in our new spaces. Uh, Mass DEP's Boston office is now at 100 Cambridge Street. We've been there since uh, the first week of December, and it's, it's a great space for us. Um, we're very happy to be um, done with all of the uh, uh, moving and, and, and storing of papers and, and all the rest. And I think we're settling in nicely uh, in that space. Uh, I hope at one point that we can um, schedule this meeting to be, um, be both in person and with a remote option. Uh, there is space available in 100 Cambridge Street to do that. I think we're just not there yet before we can um, before we can organize that, but that is our intention to, to um, bring back an in-person option for the Waste Site Cleanup Advisory Committee meeting. And the Northeast region has uh, now moved to uh, 150 Presidential Way in Woburn. Um, I've been there, that's also a very nice space. I think they arrived about the same time we did. Uh, we're all still working uh, primarily from home uh, in the office at least one day a week. Uh, so we continue to work uh, that hybrid work model. Um, 
Thank you. In terms of the this meeting schedule, you may have noticed that um, we had moved it this um, month to the third Thursday of the month. And that uh, move, I, I really appreciate the, the advisory committee members um, looking at their schedule and, and making this adjustment for us. Uh, Ken has another role in, in that he represents the department on the 21J board. And uh, our wayside cleanup meeting on the fourth Thursday of the month has, has conflicted with that meeting for years now. And we had attempted before to, to find another time and, and never managed to do that, but this time around we did. So um, going forward, um, the wayside cleanup advisory committee will still be, will still plan on holding this meeting uh, approximately quarterly. And uh, our regular meeting time will be the third Thursday of the month at 9 a.m. And we will return to um, holding office hours as well on the other thir third Thursdays of the month. So um, those, we, we were on a bit of hiatus for office hours toward the end of last year, but we will be bringing those back and, um, and planning on meeting in March. Uh, just note that this very first office hours in March uh, will be scheduled on the fourth Thursday of the month, just because there's an existing conflict there. But the plan is to return to a schedule of meeting on the third Thursday. And just um, so, oh, I'm sorry. I thought someone had a comment, but um, just so you all are aware, I, I realized that last month, um, some, some of you who are accustomed to attending the office hours had, um, had logged in to attend the meeting and we weren't holding one. Um, so I apologize for that. Just so you know, just to be sure um, whether or not a meeting's being held, uh, we do make it a practice to send out a reminder uh, email ahead of the meeting to confirm that it's taking place. So um, I would always look for an email from PWSC information um, and you can always reach out to me or Ken um, to confirm if you have some question about whether a meeting's being held. So next I also wanna, oops, I also want to welcome um, some new members to the Wayside Cleanup Advisory Committee. And I, I don't know if they're both here. Ken, maybe you could tell me. But um, as is, it's been the practice um, for the Wayside Cleanup Advisory Committee seat um, that represents licensed site professionals that the Licensed Site Professional Association uh, past president serve in that position. And um, Marilyn Wade has served in that position for the past uh, two years. Um, and, and now as M Marilyn transitions off and uh, the LSPA has a new president and, and David Leone is now the past president, David will be joining our committee uh, serving in that role. So I wanna extend our, our thank you to Marilyn for her uh, her service in, in volunteering for this committee um, and, and welcome David. Uh, also, uh, we have um, Matt Mosteller who had served in the position representing uh, water supply, at water suppliers and water supply distribution um, has stepped down from the committee. And we have uh, Jessica Kajugis Smith uh, joining the committee. She was recommended to us by uh, Mass Waterworks Association, and um, she has served as uh, the health agent for Westford. She has a background in, in water issues, uh, working with uh, Mass Waterworks Association, has, has worked in, in the wayside cleanup field. And I don't know, uh, Ken, if Jessica is here yeah, and she they're may both, want to. They're both on. They're both okay. On. So I don't want to put you both on the spot, but if you if you want to unmute yourselves and say hello to everyone, um, please do. I don't know if David's on, but um, I'm Jessica Kajiga Smith. Um, thanks for having me. Um, as Liz said, um, I work for the town of Westford. I work 
for their Board of Health for a couple of years, and I worked for their water department as well. That's really where I started in the drinking water field. Um, and then from there, I've worked as a um, consultant um, with a couple of firms. I'm currently with Tie and Bond. I'm senior project manager in the Westwood office. Um, but for the six years prior to coming to Tie and Bond, um, I worked in the MCP world doing um, site cleanup um, for you know, private and public entities, you know, throughout New England. Um, and maybe about 20 years ago or so, I worked um, as a Superfund contractor for EPA, um, you know, part of their uh, technical assessment and response team for Region 1. So I have, um, you know, over 25 years experience with water as well as um, site cleanup. Uh, I think most of you probably know who I am. Um, you know, Dave Leone, I'm an LSP at GZA. I've been here for 25 years, uh, and I'm the uh, immediate past president of the LSP Association. So looking forward to, to helping out. Great. Thank you both very much. Um, and also, I, I wanted to um, you thank extend our thanks to Matt Mosteller for uh, his service on the committee. I also wanted to mention that uh, Dr. Wendy Heiger Bernays uh, has said that she will be stepping down from the committee. Wendy has been with the committee for many, many years, um, serving in in a role as as representing academia, uh, and she is, uh, is a professor for the BU um, BU School of Public Health. So I know we've had many discussions uh, in this committee about uh, uh, new members, bringing new members to the committee and, and which seats to um, try to rep have represented. Uh, we have no set requirement to fill certain seats, but certainly I think um, having someone from academia on the committee, uh, we would be interested in, in pursuing that as well as uh, picking up where we left off on on looking um, to other potential uh, new members uh, to to make sure that we're um, representing both the work we do in terms of representing the kind of issues we need advice on, as well as making sure our, our committee represents uh, the diversity of the Commonwealth and um, and and all of the issues across the state as well in terms of uh, geographic diversity. So those those discussions and that interest in um, in the committee membership is ongoing. And I would certainly um, you know welcome hearing hearing suggestions on an ongoing basis in terms of um, filling out the committee uh, in that way. Uh, I just also wanted to return to uh, what had been a, a, a continuing topic um, this past year, and it, it will be a continuing topic, uh, I'm sure, for the next couple of years in terms of ongoing uh, hiring within Wayside Cleanup and just a, across the department in general. We're doing a lot of it. Um, I want to thank the organizations that have offered to um, sponsor our postings. Um, I, I know the LSP Association has done that for us, as well as NMOA. Um, that's very helpful. Uh, we're, we're very interested if you know of um, someone who might be interested in a, in a career with MassDEP, please uh, steer them our way. And, and I've included here the link to Mass Careers where all our postings are listed. Um, Wayside Cleanup has been doing a lot of hiring as well as uh, people assuming new roles as as people leave positions and uh, people retire. Um, and I may not I, I may not capture all of those, but I wanted to highlight uh, a few of those. I would say um, within the last since the last time we met in October, uh, we probably have. Um, 10 or so, 10 to a dozen new hires across the Bureau. And we're um, looking right now for uh, more positions than that um, to fill. So we have existing vacancies, I think on the range of, of 20 or so. Um, it, uh, in terms of um, uh, new positions we have in 
Well, John Handrahan is the Deputy Regional Director for the Southeast Region. John has been serving in that role um, as an acting basis and just recently um, has been made permanent in that position. Uh, we also have, um, in addition uh, to Ken's new position in the Boston office, uh, we have, uh, I, I think, may not have mentioned back in October that Brian Roden has assumed the position of audit and enforcement coordinator. Uh, we, we heard from David Foss back in October. You know that David is our new statewide Brownfields coordinator. Um, Janet Waldron has uh, just taken a position as the section chief for federal sites. Uh, Peter Richards has joined the uh, technical and financial services group in contracting. And I'm going to have to check my note just to make sure I will miss someone um, in the in the Western region. John Ziegler is is serving as the deputy regional director. Uh, Kim Long Longridge as the audit section chief, and Caprice Shaw in the brownfields and risk reduction section. Uh, in Northeast, um, Andrew Friedman is now the section chief in the the site management and data management group. So. Um, there's a lot of a lot of movement, um, and and there's also movement where we're where people are moving uh, between the regional offices, moving between the programs. Um, so that's all great. It's great for uh, people to take on new roles, but it is keeping us very busy, and will keep us very busy um, on the hiring front. Uh, in terms of the MCP amendments, I've included this in the transition uh, list of transition items uh, because uh, it where we are right now is is very much related to the uh, change in administration. I, I all last year we were um, updating you as to how we were getting closer in terms of final approvals, and we um, had had taken the document, um, the approval all the way to the end of the uh, necessary approvals close to what we needed in order to publish it at the end of last year. Uh, but as a result of the department's um, other regulations um, that were in that same approval path, some of which had statutory deadlines to be completed by the end of the year, um, the MCP was um, held to the side in terms of finalization. Uh, the good news, however, is that um, it's already been picked up um, in terms of uh, uh, review by the new administration. Uh, we've all, already been um, providing briefings, and so we hope that we're very close to moving forward with finalizing that. Um, so more on that later, if it, if it turns out um, that we get the approval, to finalize it between now and um, the next time we have office hours, or, the, or the, certainly before the next quarterly meeting, we will we will be putting out communication and letting you all know where things stand on that. Um, another another transition item uh, of of note is that we have uh, just renewed the site assessment and remediation support services contract. Uh, SARS-7. This is um, the contract that we use to uh, support the work that the department does, um, giving us the ability to hire, hire contractors to do site assessment work, uh, to do a range of services to help support the work that the Bureau does um, and to address uh, sites. And this has been a year-long process in terms of putting the contract out for bid and, and making the final selection of contractors. Um, many are returning, we have some new, and this contract will now be in place uh, for the next five years with the option to extend it an additional two years. So um, this is a big, big step, um, an important step, and I just wanna uh, thank everyone. Um, uh, and especially the, the group within our technical and financial services uh, division for, for um, completing this process. So at this point, I'm going to pause.
and let you hear from someone else. And uh, Ken Mara is going to provide you some updates. Um, I know this one is of interest to many of you in terms of recent discussions we've had on uh, the soil disposal capacity <coughs> options. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, by way of brief update on the soil capacity issue, as, as most of you are aware, um, the projected capacity for disposal of contaminated soil or COM 97 soils in the state is projected to hit zero in the first quarter of 2023. Um, so this has prompted a lot of activity um, um, initiated by the, the uh, Massachusetts Soil Beneficial Reuse Coalition, um, which is a group of engineers, scientists, developers, LSPs, consultants, uh, other folks, a number of you in here today are on are on this uh, are on this coalition, um, but they have proposed five different concepts to address the shortage um, of disposal capacity, and we have been actively engaged with them and engaged internally, both in Boston and with the regions, um, and also engaged not just with the Bureau of Waste Site Cleanup, but also with the Bureau of Air and Waste the Office of General Counsel and the Commissioner's Office and even the Commissioner himself, who we briefed just last week. Um, this is all still, um, this is all still work in progress. This, it, and it has been flagged in the transition materials for the new administration um, as a big issue. And our Commissioner is very well aware that it is a big issue. Um, it's all still happening as we speak. Um, as we evaluate these options, we still need to circle back with our Deputy Commissioner Stephanie Cooper and Commissioner Moran with our final recommendations on what we would find acceptable or not acceptable with the coalition's proposals. And again, I can't I can't put a time frame on that because of the transition transitions happening and, and the fact that this is all still work in progress even now as of today. But it is a big deal and we're aware of it and so is our commissioner. So I'll, I'll stop there. I know we might have some questions on that, um, but we're, the intent here is not to, to spend 10 hours talking about it, which we could easily do, but just to give you that brief update. So if there's any questions, I can take them now, but um, otherwise we'll move on. Uh, okay, Ned. Hi, I don't have a, a question uh, so much as two quick things. One, I really appreciate uh, the department's focus on this. And uh, while I'm not a member of the coalition, uh, I do a lot of work with NIOP. And from that perspective, this is one of those situations where um, it's not like it's just um, the pendulum swinging back and forth. This is instead going off a cliff or hitting a wall once you have that problem. And as all involved, I think already know, the solutions do not happen immediately. Uh, and the economic impact is, um, at least from where I touch the elephant, huge. I mean, you just projects just stop. You can't you can't do the excavation, and that's that. So I just wanted to um, uh, briefly underline the importance of the issue um, from a commercial real estate perspective. Thanks. Yeah, it's. Um... It's 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 a it's a high level issue. It's been elevated to the highest levels we can, and we, we're aware of, of its importance. Um, I see a question in the chat of what are the what are the options being considered? Again, we don't want to get into a deep dive right here. We don't have time, but um, the options basically are looking at the COM ninety seven uh, policy, the COM fifteen policy, uh, beneficial reuse determinations reuse of 21E soil at other 21E sites and the concept of a monofill. Um, and we've been discussing the various options to implement any of these concepts, whether it be through a reg change, which is, doesn't seem like it's either necessary or as we know, reg changes take a long time. They're, they're not very time efficient, but we're looking at uh, other mechanisms such as um, um, administrative consent orders or ACO amendments and thinking about the criteria that we would put into them that we would deem to be acceptable or policy revisions or even just a policy statement. So while everything's on the table, we're looking at, we're looking at everything. It's, unless we have any other questions, is there any other questions on that? Um, yeah, and I would, I would just add that if, well, I know the coalition has put together material. I, I'm not sure if they have a website, but at our October meeting, I think we did, I think 
Paul, Paul Locke walked through um, the different options. So yeah. if, if you want to go to the website and look at the October meeting materials, you can find more detail there. And there's a link to their materials on the LSPA website as well, if you click around. So, okay. Okay, so moving on, um, the next issue or item, this is a quick one, a phase, phase one site maps. Those of you who've tried to, 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 to pull one up in the last few days probably ran into uh, a problem. The, the URL has been changed as of last Monday, Monday the 13th. So that's the new URL for the phase one site map and it does work. Um, but uh, if you have it bookmarked, that would you might want to replace your bookmark with the new URL. And then from there. So I think, um, thanks, Ken. And I, are there any additional questions? I, I actually didn't pause to see if anyone had questions for me. So um, before we move on to Diane Baxter, I just. Okay. Hi, Liz. It's Janine. Uh, just a question if you have any good rumors about who the next commissioner might be. <laughs> I don't. Not, I, not actually, Paul Locke. <laughs> <laughs> not Paul actually, Locke. Uh, yeah, actually, I, we, have, we have no rumors, or I have no rumors. So, and okay. <laughs> I, I, think, I think, Janine, you, know, you probably know if I had them, I, I would also say I have no, no <laughs> information. <laughs> But, yeah, well, but, it's worth, worth a try. But I, but sincerely, I have not heard anything. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. All right. So, so um, next, uh, Diane Baxter. Diane is the division director for our federal sites division, and um, she's going to be providing some updates on federal site work uh, related to money from EPA, as well as on on brownfields work. Right. Hello. So yes, the, the the big news in the federal division is is the the bipartisan infrastructure law. I guess it has a couple of names. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is the uh, is the official title, also called bipartisan infrastructure law, mainly by by EPA. Um, but the big effects on our program are in the Superfund arena for fund lead sites, as well as in the brownfields area. So I'll focus on uh, updating as far as those go. So on, oh, uh, let's see. Okay. So the federal infrastructure law was signed by President Biden back in November of 2021. And it includes large inf increases in EPA funding for many programs, including water and sewer and a host of other programs. But in our world, uh, Superfund was uh, allotted uh, 3.5 billion nationally over five years. And for Brownfields, it's 1.5 billion nationally. In both of these cases, this is a big increase from uh, past, past funding. So I'm going to go through a little bit of what this means for each of our programs. So for, for Superfund, uh, in, in recent years, EPA funding of Superfund work has been slow um, because of incremental funding of projects. So there's been long waits for funding. And then once the funding comes, it's, it's for partial projects. So the cleanups were delayed over several years and the same was happening with assessments. Everything was funded in, in smaller increments than EPA and we would have liked. So the infrastructure funding, um, it's not coming directly to us in terms of um, you know, funds that we would use for contractors, but it's coming to EPA's budget so they can fund the work at fund lead Superfund sites um, in a in a better way than they have been recently. So related to that, uh, last week we got news that EPA uh, there was a press release announcing the start of remedial actions at three Massachusetts Superfund sites: the former Crease and Cook Tannery site in Danvers, the Walton in Lonsbury, which was a uh, plating facility in Attleboro, 
and the Nyanza chemical waste dump in Ashland. The Ashland one focuses on, on uh, DNAPLE in particular, but it's mostly uh, adding to various groundwater cleanup actions that have been going on. Uh, so it's more changes than something completely new. Walton and Lonsbury addresses uh, soil, groundwater, and surface water. And Danvers, this part of it is um, mainly uh, containing, containing soil uh, on a large former tannery site. So the way that Massachusetts will uh, benefit from this influx, influx in funding is, you know, first, obviously, sites being cleaned up sooner, <laughs> uh, reducing the, the risk to human health in the, in the environment, and also allowing quicker reuse of the projects. But there's also a financial benefit to the state in that typically uh, under Superfund remedial actions, the capital costs have a cost sharing element in which the state pays 10% of the capital costs. And these, of course, being extremely expensive uh, projects, it makes a big difference. Um, but the infrastructure law specifically eliminated the cost matching requirement from those. So, um, so we're able to benefit from, um, from these cleanups and not have to pay a cost share, which is, which is great. Um, we also, in addition to these remedial actions, the infrastructure funding is going to accelerate the pace of assessments as well. So we're seeing more of that, that EPA is starting and doing more with assessments. And they're also considering funding some things that they might not have considered in the past, um, like doing early removal actions while they're still in the midst of investigating. So we hope to see that on the lower Neponset River site uh, in the coming in the coming year. We we may actually see some sediment removal before they before the many years long process of the remedial investigation. So I think that's it in a nutshell on Superfund. On the brownfield side of things, the funding is works differently, and EPA is. Um, EPA is funding grants, and I'm sure some of you are uh, familiar with this, that there are grants av available to a number of entities. The state has uh, dedicated state non-competitive grants, and that's the, the first money that we're able to tap into is we've received a 900000 in in a separate um, bipartisan infrastructure law funded grant that we're going to be able to use to focus strictly on site assessment and cleanup projects at sites around the state. So we will be hiring contractors uh, to do required site assessments for projects, say, that, that have been stuck, either um, municip usually it's municipality owned or in some cases uh, sites where it's been lingering a long time and there's a financial inability. So some sites that have been stuck will be, will be in for assessment, some for cleanup, and we'll be directly hiring SARS and IRS contractors to do this work. Um, so we're looking at doing, fun, at least in this first year, and this 900,000 is the year one funding. We hope to get uh, similar funding in each of the next four years, the, the infrastructure fund money is five, five year grants. Um, and then in addition to this uh, non-competitive state grants, there are some other state grants that are more competitive that we hope to apply for in the coming year and uh, be able to, to uh, access that more, much more in funding. So, but at least this first year, we anticipate funding one or two projects from each of the regions in the state. Um, and the, the sites were selected by the Brownfields coordinators in the regions, uh, coordinating with our state Brownfields coordinators uh, to identify the best sites and the sites that could use the, the funding quickly. We're, we're really focusing on trying to get this uh, money spent so that EPA will be willing to give us uh, the next <laughs> the next bit of money. Uh, so I think 
I think that's uh, I think that's about it. Okay. If anyone Thank has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Diane, I also um, had a message from David that he wanted to jump in. David oh. Voss. Okay. So, so <laughs> welcome. So 15 seconds more on Brownfields, which is I'm working with uh, all the regional coordinators around the state to host some Brownfields roundtables. So some informational sessions that are open to the public. Target audience is municipalities like town managers, town planners, economic development folks, consultants, engineers, lawyers, financiers, everyone who's going to get involved with Brownfields redevelopment. And I'm chiming in now because the first one is in Worcester on March 15th. Uh, it'll be held at the Worcester Regional Chamber of Commerce. And uh, right now we have about 60 or so people registered. The presenters will be from EPA talking about their grants, mass development talking about their funding. Uh, there's a TAB program called Technical Assistance for Brownfields. And in, in Worcester, it's really for all of Worcester County, not just the city. Uh, there's good attendance from both Central Mass Regional Planning Commission and the Montachusett Regional Planning Commission. So if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, and the registration is through the Chamber of Commerce's website. They're, they're partnering with us for a location. So thanks. That's it. So it's March 15th in Worcester. Great. Thanks. Thanks, David. And I think what we can do is we can stick that information into this presentation. So if people go and find the slides too, they'll have it. Great. Thanks, David. Okay. So uh, next, uh, uh, Peggy Shaw is who, uh, along with Nancy Fitzpatrick, has been responsible for um, rolling out and the technical assistance grants these last a couple of years is going to provide us an update on the grants. Okay, thanks. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, just um, a, a little background on TAGS. Um, the purpose of the Technical Assistance Grant Program is to um, provide funding um, to support effective public involvement during the assessment and cleanup of disposal sites by um, assisting groups, um, in particular mun municipalities and community groups in obtaining expert technical assistance to understand and evaluate response actions at disposal sites and um, by enhancing public education about and participation in disposal site activities. Um, so we reestablished the TAG program after a 10 year pause. We offered the first funding round in the reestablished program during state fiscal year 2022. TAGs were awarded to three applicants in the amount of up to $15,000. And it's up to fifteen thousand dollars because these are granted on a, these grants are on a reimbursement um, basis. So they do the work, submit the invoice, and um, if it meets the um, criteria in the contract and is an eligible, then um, then we reimburse them for that amount. So they can um, do um, work up to fifteen thousand dollars, and that was for the first round. On um, these projects are currently in progress, and. Um, the, co um, the contract completion date is June 30th, 2023. So the end of the state fiscal year. We offered a second round of TAG funding, which is the topic of this slide um, for fiscal year 2023. The TAG opportunity was released on July 15th, 2022. We accepted applications through October 18th and we awarded TAGs to four applicants, uh, which was announced on December 23rd um, of 2022. And those include three municipalities and one community group. And, and these tags um, are in the amount of up to $20,000. Um, the contract process, um, it's in progress, but I'm happy to report we've had a, a very, um, very busy and productive tag week. And three of those contracts have been signed by DEP and those contracts are fully executed. So three of the, um, three of the grantees, three of these projects can move forward. Um, the fourth is in progress, it's in the pipeline. We expect that DEP will, um, uh, will have DEP signature on that contract in the next couple of weeks. So, so that contract can proceed as well, that, that work can proceed, can proceed as well. Um, these contracts will run through the end of fiscal year, state fiscal year 2024, so June 30th, 2024. As far as future TAG funding rounds, um, we do intend to continue the program. But as of 
right now, um, the schedule for third month is yet to be determined. Does anybody um, have any questions? Sorry, Peggy, there's a little feedback. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, yes, that, that, that's, that's, that's my update. I'm just wondering if anybody has any questions. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to continue on with a, a few more updates. Um, one, this one is uh, timely in that the public comment period for the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs Environmental Justice Strategy uh, is is has is closes tomorrow. Um, the the strategy has was was uh, first out in October. It is um, intended to look across all of the EA agencies and and uh, challenge the agencies to look at ways that we can, uh, within our authority, uh, expand and and enhance the work we do with respect to environmental justice. Uh, so the the document, the draft. Uh, has sections for each of the EA agencies on uh, what their proposals are uh, along those lines in terms of enhancing um, the way we we do our work and engage with environmental justice communities and and represent them. Uh, the, there were five listening sessions that were held on the strategy, uh, three of them in person and two remote. Uh, the link to the strategy is here in this document, uh, but if you were were to Google um, EA's draft environmental justice strategy, you'll find it there. Uh, I wanted to just walk you through the next steps because I uh, this will be um, meaningful for us in terms of uh, the department and waste site cleanup. In it, any question, any uh, comments that are received by EEA related to specific programs. Um, they will be bringing them back to us and we will be um, developing responses to those comments and looking for ways that we can address them in terms of changes to the program. So the next steps are in early March, um, EEA will be um, uh, assembling those comments and sharing them with the, uh, the applicable agency. Um, March through May, we will all be uh, developing um, responses to those comments, as I said, and then we can expect that by the end of June, there will be a final environmental justice strategy uh, document and a development of an implementation plan to go along with that. Um, so I I look forward to uh, seeing seeing those comments. I, I saw yesterday that the License Site Professional Association had submitted some comments related to um, the strategy in general and some specific to the waste site cleanup program. So um, I hope to see others and and uh, look forward to uh, working on working on on the suggestions that are provided to us. Uh, this is another timely update in terms of a natural resource damages grant solicitation that is that just became available. Um, this uh, is related to the uh, Blackbird and Union privileges site in Walpole and, and a natural resource damages settlement uh, for that site. There is a um, public meeting next week uh, available online for information about the grant solicitation. There's up to $300,000 that will be available for projects that are related to uh, groundwater restoration. And you can find uh, this information both on Combi's, the, the state's procurement website, as well as our natural resource damages page, the MassDEP page um, at that link. So just wanted to highlight that in terms of timing. Uh, another, another. I, I realize this is the 30th anniversary of the waste site cleanup program this year. Um, another anniversary is um, that this this year also marks the 20th anniversary of the 
Bouchard 120 uh, oil spill that uh, the oil spill that resulted in uh, 98,000 gallons of oil being spilled into the Buzzard Bay in the South Coast area. And uh, as a result of that spill, um, many changes were put in place uh, for the state in terms of uh, our response readiness. It was, um, it, it led to the development of the Marine Oil Spill uh, Prevention and Response Program. And we are looking at um, having an event in around the time of the spill. I think the date of the spill was April, I want to say April 23rd, but around the, the same time, it looks like it, it may be in early May to, to um, commemorate that event and, and reflect on all the changes that it led to in terms of our response work, our planning, um, as I said, the marine oil spill program, uh, as well as natural resource damages projects and that sort of thing. Uh, so if you are interested in attending this event, I, I would I would look for um, look forward to hearing more about it once the date's settled. Uh, you can always reach out and contact uh, Julie Hutchinson, who is the coordinator of our marine oil spill program. But I just wanted to um, I, I, we believe it will be a half day event. Um, we also will probably uh, have on hand some of our um, equipment that's given to uh, uh, towns to to um, conduct oil spill response. We'll have have that available for for people to take a look at that. Um, so more on that later. Um, Finally, before I turn things over to uh, Brian Roden, I would just wanted to update you on our work uh, related to PFAS. Um, not surprisingly, this continues to be a uh, priority across the department. On all of our programs, work is ongoing. Uh, we continue to coordinate um, uh, weekly uh, across across the uh, various programs and the regions. The the coordination that uh, Commissioner Suberg had established, where we we get together weekly to um, discuss the the emerging topics with respect to PFAS. Uh, that work is ongoing. Uh, the way, the waste site cleanup program um, continues with its response work in the regions uh, in terms of doing source and site discovery, uh, following on um, results that are coming into us, whether it's from um, detections in public or private water supplies or, or other information, uh, doing, doing additional assessment work uh, to discover the source, uh, discover, uh, identify if possible, potentially responsible parties. Uh, we're responding to the eminent hazards uh, in drinking water, still uh, using the 90 parts per trillion uh, value and, and um, our Boston office is involved in uh, providing uh, point of entry treatment systems in the case of eminent hazards, as well as bottled water in some cases. So um, that work continues on. I think in October, we were approaching about 100 uh, RTNs associated with PFAS and, and water supply impacts. And we're slightly above that now. I think it's 107 or so. Um, and we had 37 uh, poets that we have installed and we're maintaining. And that number is now at 43. So it, it's, it, there's a, a, a steady increase, um, but kind of on pace of what we've been seeing over the last couple of years. Um, I also wanted to highlight that I don't know if you all have um, seen some of the legislation that's being proposed. There, there are many bills associated with PFAS, including an omnibus bill from um, the PFAS Legislative Task Force uh, chairs. It was filed by uh, Senator Sear and Representative Hogan, um, and it, it it covers a number of different PFAS issues. Just Got my notes here, make sure I, I mention them. It sets up a PFAS trust uh, with monies available for um, PFAS um, uh, treatment and, and, and mitigation and remediation. 
Uh, it, it includes um, setting up rebates for private well owners for, um, for monies that they've spent on addressing PFAS in, in private well contamination. It has uh, provisions related to uh, consumer products and eliminating uh, certain consumer products uh, with PFAS over time. Um, it has some regulatory provisions related to um, implementing uh, uh, regulations or testing related to groundwater discharges and surface water discharges. And it in general has a, um, a focus on public awareness and bringing information to the public uh, with respect to um, the, the public health concerns uh, related to PFAS and just uh, generally um, making information more accessible and more available on PFAS impacts. So uh, we are watching that uh, as well as other legislation. It's just the beginning of the legislative season. So we, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that. We're also still watching um, what, what will develop in terms of EPA and the, um, the final health advisory on PFAS. Um, I, originally, we thought we might see something on that by the end of the year. I think, uh, I think there may be a deadline for something in March of this year. And I know our Office of Research and Standards has been uh, keeping up on that. Um, we're also um, beginning the, the process of looking at the state's um, uh, maximum contaminant level for public water supplies. Part of that was, uh, there was a, a deadline associated with that to conduct a review um, so that I think we're at the beginning of the time period where we, are, we be, begin again um, a, a review process um, looking at that standard. So that is all underway as well. Are there any questions about that before I move on to return things over to Brian? I do, hi, this is Janet Connolly. I didn't raise my hand, but I do have a question about this. Hi, Janet. Hi there. Uh, is the state evaluating ambient water quality criteria for PFAS? Uh, I, the state is looking at everything in, in, in the most general sense. I, I can't speak specifically to that. I don't, I don't want to speak. Um, I, I don't want to uh, be inaccurate, so I, I don't know the exact uh, status of where that is. But um, generally, everything is under consideration. Um, but I don't know the status specific to the ambient water quality criteria. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so now moving on, I, I think the last item we had on the agenda uh, today is to update you on where things stand with the um, active exposure pathway mitigation measures generally, and we're, we're preparing to send out the annual certification letters. So um, I want to invite Brian Roden, our audit enforcement coordinator, to, to walk you through that information. All right. Thanks, Liz. Um, all right, so we've presented statistics in the past about the number of RTNs uh, where where APMs are in place. And so again, we're just providing that statistics here. Um, you know, on the left, you can see the breakdown of RTNs that have APMs, and that's by region. You know, the overwhelming majority uh, are in Nero at 95, and then um, the other regions, um, you know, Southeast checking in at 27, Central at 18, and then Western at 10. And then also just kind of a breakdown by uh, status. Um, you know, look at the number of permanent solutions at 57, ROS 27, temporary at 37, then, then a category of other at 29. Um, you know, people will register their APOM at different times, maybe in anticipation of submitting a permanent solution or a temporary solution or ROS soon. Um, that's what kind of covers that other category. So as of uh, right now, we're at 150 RTNs. And you can go to the next slide, Liz. 
And so um, one of the reasons Liz asked me to provide a quick update is we are in the process of compiling and um, mailing and starting to mail out the certification for those APM sites that have achieved a permanent solution. So I just quickly wanted to recap that regulation. I won't read it all, but I'll just highlight a couple words. Again, that's at 40.10.25.7. And so it's the owner of the property that it has the responsibility to, um, to annually certify in response to a request from, from DEP. So again, we're going to send them a letter and a form and they are required to send that form back to us and um, as highlighted there again these are only we're only talking about sites that have achieved a permanent solution and you can go to the next slide liz um, there's sort of the the form there's four basically bullet points that the owner is going to certify uh, the first is that they're aware that the um, apum is at their site and that they have the obligation to, to operate that. Um, and the second is uh, that they are aware that DEP can um, inspect that APM. And we can go to the next slide, Liz. Uh, they also have the financial resources available in the, in the case if they need to repair or replace the components of the APM. And then finally, they're certifying that the APM is actually operating um, as it should be. And so we can go to the <laughs> last slide here, Liz. Um, so again, I mentioned that we're gonna send these letters out. Um, the letter and the form were previously discussed with the Waste Site Cleanup Advisory Committee group. Um, and these letters are directed again, only for sites with a permanent solution and they are sent directly to the current property owner. Um, we are gonna send, I think it's 65 letters that we're gonna send out I know I said there was only 57 RTNs previously that have achieved a permanent solution. The 65 also includes uh, instances where there is a partial permanent solution. So the RTN isn't classified as a permanent solution, but there is a partial permanent solution. So that's why the discrepancy there between the numbers. Um, we are anticipating sending those letters out at the beginning of March. So if you have clients um, that you know, if you want to give them a heads up, that would be helpful to us. Um, you know, these are certifications that have gone out before. If if a owner has um, closed out a permit solution before they've received it, in some of those cases where we have an email address for the current property owner, we will send it out both by email and by regular mail in hopes to um, make it easier for people and hopefully uh, is to assist us in compliance and getting these letters back. And then um, we'll also, we'll post all the letters that we sit both the ones that we send and the forms that we receive back to EDEP so that they are available for anyone to view. And I think that's the end of my quick update. If there's any questions. Brian, what happens uh, when you don't hear back from some of those owners? So, um, Hopefully we will, but inevitably there'll be situations we won't. You know, we have some options. I think what we have done in the past, um, we've sent a second letter. Uh, and then, you know, if we do not receive a second letter, you know, we, we can, we have the option of doing an audit. You know, we can actually, they, they're all AUL sites. So we can try to go that route and do an audit at the site. We also can, this is again, this is a regulation in the MCP. So we do have the option of moving um, down the enforcement road as well. So um, we're trying to make attempts to contact that owner. Um, we definitely will send a second letter. And if we don't receive that second letter, again, we will we have options that we can proceed down. Eileen? Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm curious what your response rate is. I mean, do um, most people respond or do you find that it takes a lot of follow up? It's tough to say, um, you know, we've had some, you know, during COVID, I think there are some challenges with us in terms of us not being in the office and mail coming back. So I don't have a great answer about the response rate. Um, it, it's 
it's fairly, we get a fairly high response rate. And definitely with the first couple times that they've sent out, again, we've been proactive. If Again, if we've had a phone number, we've made a phone call. I think in certain situations, we may have reached out to an, to an LSP if we've seen the site was closed out recently to say, hey, do you have the contact info for this property owner? Um, so I think we've, we've got a pretty good response rate so far, but um, it would be nice for us not to do as much legwork and just send these out and have people respond without us, you know, making second attempts and making phone calls. Thanks. Yep. Did see a question in the chat. Um, so I think that question, the APOM letter for partial permanent solution statement would only go to sites where the APOM applies to the closed portion of the site, correct? Yes, so I, I think I, I think I understand that question, Janet. Um, yeah, if that partial permit solution, if that partial solution relies on an APM, then correct, that would receive a letter. If, if there's a case where the, it has a partial permit solution for some other reason and that, does not rely on an APM and the active site has the APM, then there would be no letter to that. Hopefully that answers your question, Janet. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Yep. Any more questions for Brian? I don't see any. Thank you, Brian. So um, that was the last item we had, but I'll, I'll just pause, see if there are any more general questions before we wrap up. Stop sharing. Not seeing any, okay. Okay, well, um, thank you all Hi. for being here. Um, I'm glad we could uh, get together after um, after the new year for the first time. Um, and as I as I mentioned, we we do intend to uh, keep meeting quarterly uh, as far as the Wayside Cleanup Advisory Committee. Uh, any big news on the uh, MCP amendments? We will uh, let you know about that, uh, schedule additional meetings if um, if that makes sense to communicate that information. And we will also be resuming uh, the office hour schedule. Um, I, I think that's it. I, um, I want to um, thank you all for being here and uh, look forward to uh, continuing to work with all of you in the new year. Thanks for a productive meeting.